con todos ustedes ahora sí, el enanito que estornudaba, Matthew Wilcox. Thank you. Buenos días. It's great to be back on stage, but not as unos enanitos this time. I've spent a lot of the last 10 years understanding how people make choices. And I believe that marketing is about influencing choice. We talk about marketing in many ways, but I think you can define it very, very simply as being about influencing choice, about creating the pathway to getting chosen. And behavioral science and neuroscience has revealed a lot to us about how people choose And what I try to do is find ways of integrating what we've learned from those fields into marketing. And that's how I came to write the book, The Business of Choice. And it's interesting because this also affects the context in which content, in which content sits as well. Um, I'm going backwards, I want to go forwards. Uh -huh. I haven't learned much presentation skills, unfortunately. <laughs> the subtitle of my book is actually called Marketing to Consumer's Instincts. And there's a very, very good reason for this, which is that when you learn about how people choose, you realize how much of it, and I'm fortunate I have a large gut, uh, but we learn how much of it is driven by our gut, how much of it is driven by non-conscious processes, and how little of it is driven by deliberative thinking. We kind of follow our instincts when it comes to choice. And what I'm going to talk about today is the notion that content is very, very important, but actually when it comes to our guts, when it comes to those non-conscious processes that, that drive our decisions, content is very, very important. And Bill Gates in 1992, I think, said content is king. And I'm not as famous nor as rich as Bill Gates, but I will add to that. If content is king, context is queen. So let me explain over the next 15 minutes or so what I mean by this. So we look at this visual. This is a classic scientific test. These two colors are the same. Think of that as the content. But now let's change the context around those two colors. It's the same gray. But to our, it appears to our brains to be quite different. This isn't a magic trick, it is actually the same color. And I think sort of it's important to sort of use that sort of visual metaphor when we think about the effect that context has on the content that we produce. The first, uh, the first little story I'm going to tell you takes us to Las Vegas. I'm afraid I'm not really taking you to Las Vegas, but it's an experiment that was done by a professor at uh, the University of Arizona. Um, and what they were doing was looking at how context could change the content of a message or the effect of content. And what they, they were sort of trying to work out was that very often in marketing, we think about these people at the beginning of the, you know, the sort of these leaders who are happy to do things first, who are early adopters. And then we also think about people who are perhaps followers, who sort of follow those trends when they happen. But what these researchers were interested in showing was that this may not be about personality, but sometimes you could create this effect through the context in which you put your content. So they, ran, they, they, they looked at two different ads. One ad was about people visiting Las Vegas. And the idea was, welcome to Las Vegas. Try something different. Stand out from the crowd. Do something which is maybe a little bit of a risk. In the other ad, they changed the line to visit Las Vegas, the most visited city in the world. 100 million people go there every year. It is something that many people do. Follow the crowd. Take the safe choice. Do what other people are doing. And what they did was something very, very clever. So before they showed these people these ads, one which was about standing out from the crowd, the other was about being part of the crowd and following the crowd, they showed a quick clip 
from one of two films. So to half, the, half of the people they showed these ads to, they showed a clip from The Shining with Jack Nicholson saying, you know, all work and no play. That, those really scary moments when he's going mad, smashing stuff up and things like that. And then they showed them the ad. To the other half of the group, they showed a clip from this 1995 film, not as well known as Stanley Kubrick's 1980 classic, um, with Ethan Hawke and Julie Delphi, uh, called Before Sunrise. And this is a film, a romantic drama. And we sort of see them sort of being attracted to each other as they travel on train across Europe. And we kind of, there's always this thing, are they going to have sex? Are they not going to have sex? And of course they do in the end. But there's this kind of romantic sexual tension throughout the whole thing. So, we have one group of people who've had the shit scared out of them by Jack Nicholson, and the other group who've had their hormones tweaked a little bit by Ethan Hawke and uh, Julie Delphi. Now, what these researchers were looking at was actually to see what the effect of showing those films would be on the content. And the hypothesis was that when they were showing people something scary, that would make people respond by self-protection, by following the crowd. This is a picture of zebra migrating in the Okavanga Delta. They all herd together because they want the safety against the predators of the lions and the things that will attack them. They are following this strategy. Equally, when people feel there is the possibility of romance or sex, they don't do this. They do this. They stand out from the crowd. They try to look different. Nobody was sexually successful by saying, I'm like everybody else. <laughs> you do it by saying, I'm different in some way. I've got something interesting. I've got something interesting, so my genes are going to help your genes come along. And, and evolutionary psychologists call this mate acquisition but this notion of wanting to stand out. So, standing out is being at the front of the crowd. When they showed people the ads, so the red bar is going to be the ad which was, do what everybody else does. The most visited city in the world, visited by millions. The gray bar is, stand out from the crowd and do something different. So this first column is when people were shown a clip that scared the shit out of them. This is when they saw the Jack Nicholson clip, okay? And what happened was, the ad they found the most persuasive was the ad which said, visited by millions. The ad which said, do what everybody else does. The other ad which said, stand out from the crowd. People didn't want any part of that at all because they had been primed. The context that had been set had put them in this instinctual mode of self-protection. And when they showed the ads to the people who'd watched the romantic drama, stand out from the crowd was the ad which was most persuasive. The ad which said, be the same, was not persuasive at all. So this is a very interesting thing about the effect of, of context on our instincts. I talked about our gut responses, but what had happened there was that the, contents that the context that people had seen had affected their instinctual response to the ad, to the content they saw later on. So we're going to go from Las Vegas, from gambling and hedonistic uh, lifestyles, to Princeton, New Jersey, to the College of Theology, um, where priests are trained, uh, uh, to some very interesting research that was conducted by uh, John Daly and Daniel Batson in the 1970s. This is a very, very clever, very interesting experiment. <laughs> So what they did was they got the trainee priests or the seminarians to actually sort of look at two pieces of content. The first was the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, a parable from the New Testament of the Bible where um, a, a, a man is beaten up and left by the street to die by his assailants and a priest walks by him, a neighbor walks by him, and this com complete stranger who is a, from Samara, a Samaritan, stops and takes him to an inn and pays for him to stay in, for, in the inn for the night and gives him hospitality. So the idea of the Good Samaritan is that you should help strangers. So the first group of priests were given the text of the Good Samaritan to read, and they were told, Think about a presentation. We'd like you to write a little presentation about the Good Samaritan and give it to another group of people in another building. 
The second group of people were asked to read about job prospects for priests and also think about how they would write a presentation about that. But this is where the experiment gets very clever. So they were reading their things, and then the people organizing the research said to half of them, they said, you were meant to be there at three, five past three. You were meant to be there at 3 p.m. Go hurry, go and do your presentation to the people who are waiting for you. To the other half, they said, it's five past three. You don't have to be there till 3.15 p.m. Take your time. Okay, so half the people had read the Good Samaritan, half had read the job prospects for priests, and half of each of those, had, to half of the people who had read the Good Samaritan, they'd said, hurry up, you've got to be there. To the other half, they said, take your time. To half the people who read the job prospects for priests, they said, hurry up, you've got to be there. To the other half, they said, take your time. And I said this was a clever experiment. There's even more to it. So as these priests were going from building A to do their presentation in building B, they walked through a park, and in that park, there is somebody who was involved in the research who is pretending is an actor who oh, is pretending they're ill. They're coughing, they're spluttering, they're bending over. They look like they need help. And this was the real object of this research. The real object of this research was to see whether the priests and which priests would stop and help the guy on the bench who wasn't well. So you might think the content they'd been reading was all about half of them had been reading a story about helping strangers in distress. They'd been basically reading this story and thinking about this story and how they were going to present it. And the other half had been reading something not at all relevant. So you might think that the half of the people who'd been reading the Good Samaritan would be the ones who would stop. It makes sense, doesn't it? They'd been reading about helping strangers. Here is a stranger. But actually, that's not what happened. It wasn't whether they'd been reading the Good Samaritan or whether they'd been reading about job prospects. What made the difference as to whether they stopped or not was whether they were told they were in a hurry or whether they were told to take their time. Again, the effect of the context, how they had been primed. If they were told that they needed to get there quickly, they passed by this poor person who was apparently ill. If they were told to take their time, they had the luxury of time to be able to help. It was not at all about what they had been reading before. So I think these are two interesting experiments from the field of social sciences. And they really, I think, make this point. If content is king, context is queen. And when I say context is queen, I, I don't mean it is the companion of content. This is why I use the, 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 the idea of chess to tell this story. What I mean is that it is more powerful. You, can, you cannot win a game of chess if you lose your king, but your king will not help you win the game of chess. The piece that will help you win the game of chess is the queen. And I believe that context is the powerful thing that defines content. I just wanted to read a little bit from how I end the chapter of my book about this as a summary. And what I say in this book is context, in its broadest sense, makes a big difference in how people choose. But as marketers, we fixate on content. And we see it as king, because it seems easier for us to control. However, that is an illusion. Context can either nullify or turbocharge content in terms of how it influences choice. The king isn't dead, but long live the queen. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You're doing so well. That's it. That's it.